Welcome to we the Roundtable Podcast, or Roundtable Composers Roundtable Podcast, episode number five. I'm here with uh, Reed and Simeon. Matthias couldn't make it today. Today we're going to talk about reverbs, convolution versus algorithmic. We're going to have talk about modeled or sampled libraries, EQs, what is sketch libraries, and then we're going to have some news and also talk about, or actually tell you, the winner for the Ben Osterheis Library. And then we have some special news at the end, so stick around for that. So let's start with Reverb's read. Well, I would say um, I'm a Reverbaholic or a Reverbaholic. I have hundreds of them, not really, but I have too many, and I don't know why. They just seem to accumulate like kudzu or something like that. And um, But I only really use the IK multimedia reverbs. I know that's not the most fashionable reverb. I own all the ones that everybody raves about. I've got Fab Filter. I've got all these expensive reverbs. But I just like them because they're extremely subtle. I don't like to hear a lot of reverb. And they have a thousand ways of adjusting them. And I like that. I feel when I use, I have spaces, the east-west convolution reverb. I find when I change a space, it's a very, very big difference. And and I I just like to be able to dial in very, very little things. And And whenever I try all my reverbs, I end up using it. So of all the things I've spent money on with computer music, I think I've wasted the most on reverbs and I have no defense for this. I, I, and probably if somebody starts raving about, uh, oh yes, I mean, so I, I bought Seventh Heaven, which I never use and never will use, but oh, really? you know, I was made to feel like uh, you had to have it. So you didn't like uh, um, Seventh Heaven, I, I think it's great. I actually don't have it, but I heard some samples and I think it's amazing. <laughs> oh, but you like it even though you don't have it. <laughs> No, because everybody I, I, likes it. Yeah, that's true. Peer yeah, pressure. True. Peer pressure. But what's um, I, I I thought most pop people probably already know that. But what is the what is the difference between convolution and algorithmic, or how do you look at it? How do you use it? Sam, why don't you explain <laughs> that? <'cause laughs> well, what I know, I'm not a reverb expert, but the way I understood it through the years is that I am, everything is digital now, so maybe it doesn't really matter. But they. But you could say it like this. I actually have a video on this even. Uh, you know, <laughs> more videos about me. Anyway, no, the convolution is basically, you could say you could take a photograph of a room. You sort mm -hmm. of really capture what that room sounds like. So if you know how to do that, you can go to any space and just record it, you could say. Well, algorithmic is more of sort of uh, uh, lots of parameters and buttons where you can just you know pull everything left and right and make any sound you want. And that is more the digital reverb and convolution you could say is more of an analog sound or realistic sound uh, so most people make effects and crazy things of the algorithm so that's the the quick version of that and I found myself I used mostly convolution reverbs because I'm mostly I'm after realistic uh, sounds but when I do sound design and when I make that creamy enormous big super uh, spacey reverbs I tend to go more for algorithmic because you have to tweak the convolutions too much otherwise yeah. Do you guys use uh, reverbs a lot, or do you have the inboard reverbs that are on the instruments, or what's your approach there? Yeah, you know, a lot of times um, I I like using like the sunset sound uh, from um, from IK Multimedia. I use that quite a bit. Um, I guess it's just to try to approximate what the you know creating a room that all the sounds that you're using can fit in and that it makes sense and that they don't seem detached, but finding something that kind of glues all the sounds together. Um, I think that's one of the advantages like with uh, uh, Vienna Symphonic Library, recording everything on the Vienna, on the Synchron stage, and then you're able to use, use those together in a kind of a unified way. And the convolution aspect comes in when they've taken their older instruments and synchronized them uh, by using the impulse responses uh, from that synchron stage. And the, the, I guess the, the, the quality of your convolution reverb is going to be due to the quality of the number of samples they've taken of the room. 
so you're going to that's that's going to determine the limitations so what the what i gather that they did with the Vienna symphonic library is they took impulse responses from the different locations of the instruments so when you put the impulse response for the violins it's going to be positioned right where they're where they're supposed to be mm -hmm. so it's um yeah you know convolution can be great or it could it could stink just as bad as a really bad algorithm it, it just depends on how they've executed it um I think liquid, what is it? Liquid li, uh, cinematic reverbs, they are, they are like an algorithmic reverb, mm -hmm. but, but, it, but yet it's at a level where it approaches convolution in a way. It's kind of blurs the line. So it's, it's fascinating where, where you can take snapshots of these places and put them right there in the room together. Uh, I think that is really amazing. Yes. And I'm laughing at myself because I'm going to be famous for the guy who never remembers anything because I just realized there's a reverb out there that you can try for free and uh, maybe I have to look it up later when somebody talks and put it out there that you can actually put the players the way you want it yourself. So you get a room, you have lots of different rooms and then you can say here are the violin players or here's this section or whatever. It's, it's really nice and it's visual so you don't have to be an expert. You can just put oh here's the mic or here's the reverb. And uh, so you just create a space that way. It's really, really nice. And, something and the impulse, res play. well, yeah. And the impulse responses go beyond just the room. It's the microphones that are in the yeah. room. So you yeah. can have a, a Neumann uh, mic, mic pair or whatever, you know, uh, that's what, that gets crazy when you can, you know, mic model, you know, choose different convolution sets based on the mic type, not, it, uh, yeah. So it just starts, it starts just going down and down and down. Yeah. See, I'm never interested in, in realism. I just like there's a sound I want to get from a guitar or whatever. And uh, so I look for something that's going to make it sound good. So I'll often, you know, if I'm, let's say I'm using Orange Tree samples and they have all these great presets, there'll be a reverb on some of these presets. And I'll just go, I like all the sound effects that they put on. I like all the way they process the sound and that's my sound. I'm just going to use that preset in my song, maybe change it slightly, but it's never occurred to me that I would want to put that guitar in the same space as anything else. It's like my music is just not that way. You know, I just hope it will sound good to me. Uh, if I was really seriously writing orchestral music, I think that I would use VSL because I think it's brilliant the way, as Simeon has pointed out, what they do is so, yeah. it just seems like such a great choice. But when I do use something like uh, cinematic studio strings or fire, I mean, I like the sound of the rooms that they're in. So I'm just fine without any reverb on those things. I just go, all right, that's the reverb. Yeah. That's the natural reverb of those rooms. And I'll do nothing else but just leave that be. No, but that's a good point. If they're recorded in a great space, then you don't need that. It sounds uh, good on its own. And that's one of the selling, uh, what do you call it, uh, things for Spitfire and uh, for Cinematic, for example, or Ocine Strings, for example, or Cine, Cine Brass, because they have really nice uh, rooms, exactly. Uh, but I was thinking, um, but well, it, there's a lot of people saying that uh, we talk about, you know, read you saying I don't care so much. And I think that's totally fine because there's a lot of people saying that, oh, it's very important it has to be in the same room and all that. Uh, I'm, I, I actually doubt that most people can hear that. Oh, he used two different reverbs there. I, I just, yeah, yeah. that's a little bit of BS actually. So just go with sounds good and what works. If there happen yeah. to be five different reverbs, who cares really? Seriously, it, I think it's just, you know, I have this fantastic reverb. But I also w I want to say I'm a little bit spoiled. It's not that I have tons of great reverbs, but it is actually true. Maybe you hate or love Cubase, but the reverbs included there are fantastic. They are. They are. I agree. <laughs> that is so true. They're yeah. really good. Yeah. So I don't need to buy a lot. I, I have some other ones, but uh, I just realized that uh, Cubase is very complete. So. So Steinberg, Steinberg you, you, we have a sponsor. No, anyway. So, <laughs> but how do you guys use reverb? Because I, myself, for example, I, I realized we could take East West Hollywood. They, they now come loaded. Every sound has a reverb in it. But I actually turned that off 
and then I put my own reverb. It, it's not just so I want it to sound the same because I care a little bit less about that, but it's actually to save computer power. Because mm, if yeah. you have 30 instruments at the same time, you know, it's like, that's a lot of reverbs. So I usually That's the other thing with convolution is that it takes a lot of, a lot of processing power. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of contact libraries that use a lot of the convolution engine. Uh, that's what causes that CPU to start spiking because of all the intense processing that has to go on when you're calculating those uh, those spaces using convolution. That's why algorithmic reverb is a lot easier on CPU. Mm. So so you gotta you gotta find that that balance. Yes. So what is um, a good reverb if somebody doesn't have Cubase, or no, if Tom if Tom doesn't have a really good reverb, but you feel like they wanna, you know, they wanna spend all the money there is, but they still wanna upgrade or just have a decent reverb, what do you think is a good start? What do you say, reverb? Oh, well, I think the East West reverb, the um, which is Al, which is um, convolution. convolution reverb spaces. I think that's really good. That's that's where I turn if I'm I'm gonna do that. Well, it's I included like, in the in the subscription so it's a no-brainer there of yeah which i don't have but i i bought oh. actually i got the composer cloud and that was one of the things that sold me on getting it mm -hmm. and and they have so many sales that that i think it's it's a good deal i i um think that even tide makes good stuff i like yeah. the fab filter reverb yes i forget the name of it but i think that's really beautiful and um gosh the stuff in complete is good, in my opinion. And yes. I, yeah. I, I mentioned the IKK multimedia reverbs, and um, I don't think people really try them, to be honest. It's just, it's, there's, they're too snobby to like say, oh, these are actually good. But I think if you really gave them a fair listen, and uh, there's, there's a room and a spring, I think, in a hall, and I usually, and, and I'm not a really a preset guy. I like to dial around. And it gives me so many opportunities to find exactly what I'm looking for. So I don't know. What do I do when I'm looking for a reverb? I take all my favorite ones and plug them in and see how yeah. they work in the mix. And guess what? It's always, like I, say, I always say, Omnisphere wins. Mm -hmm. You know, I... I you know, that's my personal one. And, you know, when I finally move up and get um, Total Studio, the new one, then I'll have that Sunset Reverb, that Simeon's. And I, I, yeah. I'm sure it'll be good. There, Among the other things I own, there's the Isotope ones. Um, and uh, Arturia has reverbs. I got one for free. Best Service gives away these... Uh, kind of best of reverbs uh, during their sales or Black Friday sales. And those are really good too. So I mean, are there I'm any not reverbs even... that are cheap and oh, I, I, that you definitely get like a first buy if you don't know if there's so many options. Do you have any suggestions there, Reed? I mean, everything you said, it sounds like, you know, that's probably good, I agree. But I just wonder if you have, if you thought about that. Well, I mean, that, that Arturia one was given away free. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like, it's like hanging around uh, for these sales, one of the things that gets given around, I think, Raum, the native instruments, yes. no, the native instruments reverb was given away free as a Christmas yeah. thing. So you can't really, uh, it's a kind of wild reverb. Oh, that but, was great. Yeah. yeah, but it's really good. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, like everything else, it's sales. Mm. Figure out what interests you. And certain times of year, like Black Friday, some of these things are going to come up for practically nothing. So you really have to think about um, what you want. And in terms of IK, they put everything on sale. IK is very good, actually. I really like their plugins, I have to say. So I, I haven't tried the reverb, so I'm sure it's good. I just for, I mean, just listening to the other stuff. But Simeon, do you have any um, any reverbs or any? Tips? Well, I was I was looking. I was I was opening up my my list here. And um, you can see behind me, all of this list pops up with just reverbs. Yeah. Um, and 
normally what I and I'm going to mention waves. Um, I know I know there's a lot of mixed feelings about waves, but um, no, it's good. I I've stuck with them. Um, I, you know, I'm not on the latest waves. You know, so a lot of times there's a problem when they update something or they add a plugin that you have to update whatever, and it just like is a big mess. But so I've learned to kind of preserve the the ones that I have that are maybe like. Uh, maybe eight or nine, I guess version eight or nine. Um, but I go to the Abbey Road Chambers. I love, I love that uh, on the, on string sections and things. So I usually go to that. I go to Sunset Sound a lot, and then the CSR from IK Multimedia. The 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 plates and the halls are great. Mm. Um, and let me actually see what H else. reverb uh, from Waves uh, recommend that. That's the that's the other one. Yeah, that's the other one. I'll use I'll use that one like on on vocals sometimes, just to get that. Or sometimes I'll use it on on the orchestra bus, and I'll just kind of run everything through through that just a little bit, just to kind of you know pull every you know like again just to kind of glue everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody asked about Valhalla in the chat, and I'm not yes. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I've, I've not tried that myself, but uh, have you guys had any experience with that? They're terrific, and you can get free demos. So anybody who's curious about it, and it's one of those companies like Indigenous where there are never any sales. It's anytime you buy, it's a very low price. It's $50 for their yes. reverbs, and you can demo them and see for yourself. I don't think... I've seen videos where people compare... Valhalla reverbs to the most expensive reverbs and they get the same quality of wow. sound out yeah. of the Valhalla. So I don't see, I, I think that's a very good answer to Sam's question about something. That's 50 bucks and you don't have to worry about it being cheaper and it, they're, I don't think there are better reverbs out there. I, I recommend Valhalla yeah. totally. A lot of people really swear by them. And they, their whole thing is that they try to model sort of old stuff and old styles. So each reverb can do one thing. If you care about, you'll be able to do more. Maybe you want to get more reverbs. But uh, no, no, they're, they're amazing. They sound really good. And it so are cheap. they the ones that do the Briscotti, trying, the emulation of the Briscotti reverbs? Ooh. Is that Don't ask the guy who never Valhalla? remembers anything. So. Briscotti is that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, that, yeah. yeah. A lot of people do. Um, I think some of the best service ones do. But that's exactly, you know, I just can't get in. One of the things I, one of my pet peeves is always these trying to recapture some really expensive equipment. Yeah. And it's like, okay, eh. you know, oh, <laughs> I don't have whatever it is. I. But, you know, they, they've got the IR. Our stuff, and I think some of the Waves IRs have those. Yeah. Well, Waves yeah. have a bad yeah. rep because of their selling tactics, but otherwise they do have some good plugins. It's just to admit it's the it's do. the land of the twenty of the infinite twenty nine dollar sale. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's really cool. <coughs> so if you hang around long enough, it'll it'll be twenty. The you Abbey Road find, reverbs will be twenty nine. You will you know. find what you want for <coughs> eventually. Yes. So guys, yeah. Let's so move, yeah, the Valhalla works. has the yep. super massive free. That's what oh, I'm seeing yeah, yeah, there. Yeah. So. But that's kind yeah, of the a super uh, massive is... delay reverb uh, mix thing there going on. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, really cool. Yeah. Okay. So guys, let's uh, move on to model the sample. We we're talking a little bit, you know, uh, about reverbs, and they really are all digital. So it's kind of funny when you talk about model or sample. So what do we mean with that, Seaman? Uh, can you introduce us to model? Yeah. Samples? So. So um, I've worked uh, I've worked a lot with uh, Piano Tech uh, over the years, and I've I've watched watched them for man probably since the beginning, and so so basically my understanding of how modeling goes, and I've learned a lot more over the years. So they will take a um, they will take a reference piano, so like with their uh, New York Steinway. And the Petroff, the new Petroff, they have a reference Petroff in an anechoic chamber, and they basically they do sample it, but they use the sampling to break down and analyze what's happening with the with the piano. So so they will, uh, it's almost like synthesizer modeling. So you you've got somebody that wants to model a memory mode. Well, they will take the circuitry and try to model the different components of the filters and all of that, the oscillators. Same way with the model piano. So they'll take and model a soundboard. 
they'll take and model the hammers. They'll take and model the, uh, the string length and the string material. So every component of the piano is broken down into these digital models and components based on the, uh, the reference piano. Uh, so Petroff was one of the very first that had their own anti chamber that you've got this concert grand sitting in so you can get very accurate um, uh, data to base your model, models on. And with each, um, with each model or each update to Piano Tech, they just keep improving. So the thing about, uh, especially Piano Tech, there's, there's, it, it's, it's just like you love it or you hate it. There's really no middle, middle of the road sometimes. It's like, and I call it the uncanny valley of, of uh, instrument modeling. So it's almost like with the CGI in, in, the, in the movie world, uh, CGI back before it became more advanced, it's just like, it looks real, but eh, there's something about it that just doesn't look quite real. And so we, we're, we get a pushback because something about it is almost too perfect. Um, and so we, we, we just kind of, it just kind of hits you wrong. And that, I think that's what, what we're seeing with the instrument modeling, because it's almost too pure, or there's just one thing about it that just kind of tells you that you're not listening to the real thing, that, that it's that uncanny valley. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm finding the same thing with the, um, with audio, with SWAM, with sample software audio model modeling. And I'm still diving into that with their violins and cellos and their woodwinds. Um, it's the same, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's taken those different components of what makes a violin a violin and breaking it down digitally. Um, and it's, it's very interesting. The, the other thing is that you've got a piano model, but you have to put it in a room. Mm. So there again, you have the convolution and the modeling of the room in play. And, uh, and, and again, with piano tech, you can actually design the room the piano sits in. You can, you can say, I want a room this, this, this wide and this deep and this tall. And I can take the microphones. I can say, I want the microphones over here. I want two here. So it's, it's crazy. Uh, but I don't think we are at the point yet where you you can tell the difference between uh, like a sampled piano or a real piano. There's, there's nothing that will ever replace in my mind sitting down behind an actual instrument and playing it because there's too much that goes on, uh, you know, in that, in that realm. So that's, that's, it in a nutshell. <laughs> it's a great start, actually. Uh, I want to mention another a very interesting uh, company uh, here. I'm going to put it on screen. It's called, uh, I forgot what they call AV. They have the Infinite Brass and Infinite Woodwinds. And this is really something to check out. I still agree entirely what you're saying, um, Simeon, about everything, uh, because that's the same for me. I really love this idea. I wish it was better because you don't have to have three billion gigabytes of, uh, of yeah. uh, samples it's just you know it's much much easier to to it's much easier to um, to keep it your resources are better less ram less memory everything so so i really wanted to go there i think this there's one more thing apart from the technology being there yet but it's going to happen more and more it is that even though when you sample instruments, even though it's just notes most of the times, there is still a soul there. And I'm not talking just religiously. There is a performance there. And we can take Ben Osterhaus as a great example. His library is a little bit different, but there is a real performance there. And that really adds a layer that is very important. And I think it's not just that the sound is not there yet. It's also that something's missing because it's just raw data without purpose that sounds a bit too raw but there's something about that that i, I think i can hear otherwise and here's here's well here's a twist on that because the the thing is so you have a craftsman that makes a makes an instrument like a guitar or or a violin so you take that concept and you have the craftsman making a digital instrument so they hand this to you and then you impart uh you know you're not playing back recordings of somebody playing a piano you're actually affecting the, the their performance. So, like with a modeled instrument, it re, it's responding to the input that you're giving it. So you're not playing back recordings. You're actually, you know, performing on this instrument. You know. So, and I absolutely agree. That I call it a residual effect. So I've traveled quite a bit and played so many different pianos all over the world, and it and you sit behind some pianos, and it's just like you you know some other people have been there. 
Mm. And you know, some really skilled musicians have been there. You and then it's it is it's something you you leave behind a part of yourself when you're when you're playing these instruments, and that's what a lot of these that's what you're talking about. It's that human factor. It's the heart of the instrument, the heart of the library that really makes things special. Yeah, in fact, some of the really old synthesizers that were you know Steve Wonder and other rich people used in the 70s and 80s. They were these, you know, of course the technology is advanced, but they were famous for, for being able to do any sound. And they they were actually able to do any sound. It's just that they forgot all the extra bits and sounds and uh, noise that instruments make, you know, creaking or the bow doing something or the instrument itself. They were just doing sort of waves, you know, without all that extra stuff. And I think that's what you're talking about, Simon, and I agree with that. There's so much other stuff going on. So I still, I really hope that this technology goes better and better. Uh, because, for example, I think piano tech is really amazing, but I'm not sold. I, f I find that other sample libraries are way better. It just, I'm picky, but I just, I, I won't swap out my sample pianos for piano tech. Uh, no, maybe in the future, if they get even better, I don't know, because they're pretty impressive. What do you think, Reed? Well, I think if you play an instrument, and if you've played an instrument for decades, you're never convinced by any virtual instrument because you just know, like if I play my guitar for two minutes, immediately you would see uh, that no virtual instrument could do that. Even if it cost millions of dollars and even if they spent a hundred years doing it, they couldn't do it because mm. it's not that I'm so great, but that what's going on between those strings is so complex. All these different resonances and all these different, it's just not possible. And, and uh, that said, I am firmly in the sampled camp. And I think that modeled instruments can be useful to layer with samples, just as I always, from the very beginning, of my interest in this is I would take something like a DX7 piano and put it with, which didn't sound anything like a piano, and I would put it with, um, you know, my Mirage sampled piano, and the combination oh, yeah. was something that I liked. But yeah. I'll, I'll give one other thing I would say is there's a company in Montreal called Applied Acoustic Sy yes. Systems, AAS. And they will do things that are very interesting. They have a series of two libraries called Masala, which were done by Christian Lafitte, I think is his name. And so these are world libraries, which they describe as being from everywhere and from nowhere. So that's the beauty of it. These are world instruments, but they don't exist. So they don't have to sound, you know, yeah. if they were going to play one of these instruments, sometimes they put a name on something and I'll laugh because, it, you know, I can get a better version of it from a, a sampled library. But some of the things that they can do are quite interesting. Blend them in with a sampled library. I, I, I just love um, the Masala libraries. There's two of them. And there's another, <coughs> excuse me, there's another one called journeys which is kind of brings in the kind of terralanti idea of you're also going into the past mm -hmm. it's not just mm -hmm. other lands but and so that company i think is really yeah, they, really special they were one of the first companies to to do uh, sa uh do modeling they uh, i mean way way back <clears throat> in the early well the late 90s i, I think they they actually bundled uh, their task span modeling with uh, with cakewalk and uh that was my first encounter with them and i've just fallen in love with with what they're doing with like the roads their lounge lizard and their guitars and uh what is it chrome chromophone that is that is a fabulous uh library i mean the scent or plug-in uh whatever yeah wonderful. i think the first time i ever experienced it was i don't remember the name of it but there's a wonderful instrument within logic that is a modeled instrument. I don't remember the name, but I'm sure everybody knows. Hmm. But I, I'm it, thinking, it's a string I, thing. I don't think I actually have at the moment. I don't have any model inst. I just have to. Well, I don't know. Actually, I, I was thinking what really counts as model if you think about it. But if we can, I get 
the way we talk about it. No, I only have sample libraries, or I only use them, actually. I guess it depends a little bit on what you're doing. And I guess... I, I, was, I was watching a um, video, training video, some guy was showing you how to do orchestral templates, and he had a reactor library, which was a violin library, which he put in his template with all his expensive stuff, because he liked to mix in this modeled, which is a free reactor instrument. You know, if you have reactor, you, those of you, you know, you can just get a whole ton of free stuff for reactor, just like you can for contact. And mm. it's free violin. And it's really, really good. Wow. All right. Oh, there's Linda. Hello, Linda. So. Hey, Linda. <laughs> well, you know Linda. <laughs> <laughs> we all know Linda. I don't know. Uh, let me see. Well, uh, so you AQs? guys, do you guys have a lot of model libraries or not, uh, Simeon or Reed? I mean, I guess synthesizers are really model, you could say, but yeah, we're not talking about, they're not trying to emulate perhaps uh, a real instrument that way. So maybe, I don't know, maybe it doesn't count, but do you have a lot? Simeon? Yeah, I've got to, I've got to check out the Cherry Audio stuff, the Cherry Audio, the memory mode that, that they've done is, and some of the other uh, vintage synthesizers they're doing. It's, it's, it, yeah, it's, um, it, it looks and sounds very interesting because uh, I was in a music store back in the mid '80s when the Memory Moog came out and was like, "Oh my gosh!" It was. I mean, I got to I got to see one and it was like, "Wow, this thing is incredible!" But it was like ten thousand dollars. It was yeah. like, "Whoa, that's okay." Just out of high school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wow, way cool. way out there. But now you can have it for like thirty nine dollars, and it's like incredible. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah, incredible stuff. All right, cool. And Reed, do you do you use them a lot, or you you are in you sample? Use base? what? S uh, sample models, models, models. Sorry, modeled synthesizers, or well, no? Modeled, in terms yeah. of, I don't use modeled instruments aside from uh, the AAS instruments that I use. Mm -hmm. I always use. Uh, I don't turn to them. Synth is, synth is different. You know that I use, but uh, yeah, there's just a clear sense where they're going. I'm making a sound which is not meant to sound acoustic. It's a, it's a yeah. synth sound. It's what it's what uh, what uh, Simeon. So the metaphor of the uncanny valley, like you're watching a video game, and I go, yes, that is supposed to be a person. I will go with that. Hmm. But yeah. you know, <laughs> but you know, you're yeah. never convinced that that person, that character you're following, really is a person and i've seen it done tremendously well um but still i i just yeah. hope that, that the, it goes forward because i don't think that it's either or i i hope more for a combination of these technologies because i was thinking of the the giant that native instrument has that that's it is a real existing piano but still that idea that you can sort of stretch an instrument and make it bigger than it is i mean maybe like violin be longer taller i don't know or piano have 10 feet long strings i don't know stuff like that that is not realistic in a way that would be really interesting if technology can go that way so we can sort of uh, what do you say crush my, my vocabulary today is really bad so we can just go beyond the limits of an instrument and find new sounds uh, yeah. that that would be interesting to me anyway let's let's keep on and talk about eqs uh, i don't know if this is the most exciting topic here but i have <laughs> got a lot of questions about this so i thought we could talk about it and so do you use eqs do you use these model ones are they important you know do you use the ones in your jaw and what for so maybe i can start and say you know what i don't use eqs that much shame on me no there's nothing wrong with eqs <laughs> they're amazing but here's the thing i I made a video of this, and sorry to plug all my videos, but what I'm trying to say is that I EQ with my music. So when I write, I kind of try to feel, okay, what do I need right here? Okay, so I need that violin. Well, maybe I need a higher register. Well, then I have a different kind of sound in the violin. I can ob obviously tweak that quickly with the EQ, but I try to write the music, so I use instruments as my EQ. They, they they mm. create the whole picture and I use volume a lot. So if I need less with a high frequency, I might lower that instrument just a tiny bit. See, I need more bass or, or stuff like that. So that's how I EQ most of the stuff. And then in the end, if there's trouble, then it's when I put on EQs. Now that's not a better way of to work. It's just 
what I like to do because I work with the instruments more. And some people are more into uh, sort of sound technician working that way. They might really want to find the perfect EQ. For me, the, the technology is quite simple. It's basically volume on different frequencies and you can find all this there's so many EQs on the market that do so many things. This one does this, this one has model after that, this one has more saturation, all kinds of stuff. And I'm sure that is true. But unless you really, really, really know what you're doing and you have an amazing room, you have these amazing speakers and you have time and uh, a great room, it's very difficult to hear a great difference between these EQs. So I say, if you don't work that hard with EQs, then use the ones that are included in your DAW. Otherwise, the main reason for me to, to buy or invest in EQ is that it is easy to use, that it has an interface that doesn't make you go crazy, you know, like trying to turn on a bunch of knobs and dials that are just annoying because you're using your mouse, you're not using your hands, you know. Or if the EQ can teach you something, it can help you out, it can think a little bit for you, do something for you that you might not uh, know yourself if you're not that experienced or if you want to speed up the process. But that's my main take on it. The way I write music, I EQ in my music, and then EQ is troubleshooting, I would say. Or maybe a last finish if I, I feel like, no, the whole piece needs to have a little bit more nice sheen uh, at the end, and maybe I'll use an EQ for that. So, how do you use it, Simeon? <laughs> well, you know, it's just, it's just making, a, making pl a place for every instrument to sit in the spectrum. Yeah. So I, I look at things like uh, like the like a rainbow or the frequency spectrum, um, and everything has to occupy its own place in that in that spectrum. Uh, and then you know having all these overlaps and things, I think EQ helps to kind of carve out the spaces for every instrument. And I you know I pretty much use the EQ and in Cakewalk uh, in the Pro Channel. It's just so accessible. It's boom. It's right there. Um, and uh, most of the time I'm just, I'm finding, you know, I'm, you know, you know, high passing stuff, just getting out the mud of, of things and then trying to just, you know, not, not have instruments collide mm -hmm. frequency wise. Um, and I, I use this plugin from waves factory called uh, track spacer a lot, especially when I'm working with vocals. So Great it plug. really kind of helps to to get a vocal to kind of sit where you want it in the mix uh, so it's it's kind of like an active eq type of thing uh but i really like that and i use golfos a lot on my mastering bus uh golfos is a an incredible plugin because um if you've got a lot of miles on your ears you're going to have a hard time hearing all of the balance and all the frequencies and so Normally, what I have on my master bus, I have uh, Golfos, and then I'll have Isotope, uh, uh, R, um, Isotope um, Ozone. Ozone. I'll have yeah. Ozone Nine there, yeah. and then I'll have their tonal balance uh, at the last. So those mm -hmm. those tools kind of give me an idea on how how things are fitting into the to the mix, how things are balanced, how the frequencies are being balanced. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just it's just incredible. So sometimes when you're not able to hear all the frequencies that you want to hear, sometimes you do need to go like to some of the tools that that will help you visualize it. Um, so you can, you know, sometimes you might not be able to hear it, but if you can see it um, and feel it, then then it, it is, it's an easy it's a good way to it's good tools to use. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It does save some time. And, and I just wanted to add before our read gets the word here is that uh, the reason I use a lot of those tools myself is that I want to focus more on the composing and less on the uh, on the fixing the sound later and if you love doing that go ahead but a lot of people feel like oh I shouldn't use these automatic ones it's not the real thing and all that well I just want to you know get my music qu out quickly with a fairly good uh, result so I, I love this there's one Greg Wells I don't know if you mentioned that from Waves oh yeah yeah that, that is really really good as put as a last finisher so how about you the mix oh, the mix centric is that is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, mix centric is actually really nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think my approach is very similar, or is the same as yours, Sam. But I, I'm not an orchestral composer, so I'm usually working with six or eight instruments, and I put them in the different spots and uh, and try if something is in the same range, I try not to let it play at the same time. 
Um, I'm doing this really complicated piece right now um, for a video I'm working on where I use world instruments from all these different countries at the same time. So Middle Eastern instruments playing with African instruments playing with, with Asian instruments. But it's very simple, you know, I don't take the plucked instrument from one country and play it at the same time as the plucked instrument from another time. They're just, they're separated and it's pretty simple that way. And at the end of it, I'm sure I will have trouble mixing it because I always do, but hopefully I try to plan. And to me, at least it's not, you're not in terrible trouble with the mix. I don't understand people who deliberately make music where they're saying, well, I'm doing EDM and the bass guitar is at the same time as the drum and that kind of thing doesn't make any sense to me. Like, why? Just don't play the drum. Just play the bass then. Don't need to pull them out. You know, you, you, I'm sure there's a way to make music without having two notes in the same spot that need to be divided. Maybe that was a really dumb thing I just said. But that's the way my approach to everything is try not to have any collisions mm. and, and right uh, the, something we said before you know uh, what's interesting to me that in this world everything is possible so i always give the advice first and say if you have written something that then naturally there's a huge problem that maybe you should look at that orchestration or whatever you do that maybe it's not the greatest combination you know and why not? If you can fix that problem with uh, smart EQ and uh, some nice, you know, compressors, then you absolutely go ahead. It's just an advice that, you know, if if there's so much work that you have to EQ for days to get it to sound good, then maybe it's not a great arrangement. You know? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I say. You, you know what I do before I EQ when I do a bad arrangement? Mm -hmm. I remove tracks. Yes. Yeah. And I find with just hitting that mute button. It gets a lot better. You just go, you know, they're they're coming together. So let me just get rid of one of those. And, and volumes. All of a sudden, yeah. Yes, volumes. People, people forget the volume button. That is a kind of EQ if you think about it, because you yeah. know you have several things in an orchestra or band, and you can just EQ your sound by changing the volumes there as well. So. And and you also can change it spatially, push some stuff into the. You know, there's. There are things that can make music wider and make it more focused, and you can change the panning. There are different things that you can do that don't involve EQ. Yeah, absolutely. And I would, I would say always cut before you boost. You always want to make sure that you, you're not boosting all these frequencies. You want to cut, you know, cut before you boost, that's good. That's um, good because rule. that's going to always re result in, for me, it results in a lot better experience. Yes. You know, the big problem I have with it is the instruments sound good. They do have by a themselves. So why do you want to start messing with their natural sound in order to make them work with your damn music? I mean, leave them. They sound good. Leave them yeah. sounding good. Unless you want to do creative stuff. So you're absolutely right, Reed. I, oh, I'm not me. <laughs> no, but maybe and you I'm, want I'm a violin to sound like it's in a, in a glass bottle. I don't know. But I'm just saying that there are, you know, this creativity. Sorry, well, sorry. in reaching your ways, point, yeah. more, more and more, it, you don't have to do much because it's done already there in the production. If, if, the, if the library was done correctly, you've got Abbey Road, you've got all these big studios, mm -hmm. and they have already kind of, they've, yes. done, they've done the hard work for you uh, pretty much because, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll try to find a, a bad spot. It's like, hey, I don't have to do anything here, mm -hmm. so let's move along. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's, yeah. that's a great uh, thing to mention that a lot of these complete libraries, like I don't mean the native instrument, I mean orchestral libraries often, everything is pre-mixed for you there. So you yeah. just have to, it's panned and ready to go, it's really, seriously. You, you don't have to do a lot, you just play it. Like East and West is like that, and uh, Spitfire, some of their combination is like that. Uh, the BBC well, I know like that with yeah. their, the Spitfire's latest update to their symphonic collection, They've got the Jake Jackson stereo mixes, and it's like, man, I'm going to use those, and they they sound they sound incredible, and you don't have to worry about selecting which mic position because you know Jake Jake did a fantastic job doing that for you. So it's like uh, that's what helps speed up the process too. 
So you're not you're not searching for days for that mic right mic position, you know, unless that's what you want. Mm. Absolutely. Okay, good. Uh, we're, we're, we're covering some some good advice here today. Should we uh, jump on to the next one? Sketch libraries. Um, I forgot who was supposed to start with this one. Well, who wants to jump? I I wanted to ask all of you, both of you, what how you define a sketch library. What is a sketch library to you two? Um, well, <laughs> it's funny. I have another video about that one. Sorry about that. Plug in. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I do. But so <laughs> I'm trying to not repeat myself too much here. Um, well, I have a lot of interesting conclusion, but let's just say directly. Uh, I think the idea of a sketch library, it's something that doesn't take a lot of time to just load up and go. I have an idea, load it up, done. I want to try this out. I don't want to sit here and figure out 16 different mic positions and articulations. I just want to try my ideas out. Because if I sit there and just load the right patch and look for the right sound, my creativity is gone in 10 minutes. So for me, Sketch Library has to be something that is fast, but it sounds good enough that it inspires me. So, stop there. Yeah, I just take my sound canvas with the general MIDI set and just sketch with that. You know, you do. that's the thing. Something, no, no, no. <laughs> I, used, I used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to. Yeah. This, this beautiful uh, XP50 here has just uh, been a workhorse. I mean, uh, but but that's what you would have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you would have you would have the limitation of the that that 128 general MIDI sound set, and that's what you had to work with, mm -hmm. and that's what you had to make sound sound nice. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and so now you have to find you, the level has been raised so much, but you still have to have the same qualities. So you have to have a, a library that has all of the sounds that you need to start with, and that's very accessible and quick to uh, to to do it. And I think for me, um, I, I think uh, the Abbey Road uh, series is good, but yet I wouldn't necessarily call it a complete sketch library because right now it's not complete. Mm -hmm. um, the BBCSO core, I would say, would be a great uh, sketch library for orchestration because it's 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 got a more complete thing. Uh, Albion, audio Albion. and Peria is, uh, well, uh, Albion. Albion Albion's good, yeah. Okay, yeah, and Sketching. Albion will take you into oh, yeah. into cinematic stuff too, oh, you're not just about orchestral. That. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking, I guess, orchestral sketch libraries. Uh, BBCSO would be great, and then uh, Albion. I've got, I love Albion mm -hmm. because it's got some of the uh, original strings and everything. So it, it's a great cinematic starting point. No, but I mean, if you want to um, do a quick uh, flute section sketching, you know, just load up the flute in Albion. I mean, you, yeah. you're ready. It's that's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, it's true. Like that. I forgot. I forget about that a lot. Um, Audio One Period, Nucleus, they, they've got some great Amazing. complete sketching libraries, you know, so. But you yeah, know one that is actually, I've realized now, fantastic for this, like really amazing. It's the orchestrator from Opus. Because if you have an idea, I just I don't know what to do with this brass thing. You just load up one of those uh, brass patches in the orchestrator, and you just play with the chords. Uh, yeah, take, I don't want to talk too much about it, but you get some fast results there. I'm amazed by it, and it, it often sounds really good because everything is sectioned out for you. So you get a great idea that sounds very good from the start. So. Do yes. either of you think that? Uh, a sketch library has to have solo instruments, or can it just be ensembles? I mean, some of these libraries you mentioned, they have some solo instruments, but not all the solo instruments. I mean, like the Inspires, for example, even if you own both of them, you don't have the main solo instruments. I mean, what do you need to have in a sketch library? Is it, can, it, can it just be ensembles and a few? Uh, few solos it, for me it needs to I, be, it's hard to say because it needs yeah. to feel inspiring and that's me personally i'm not saying that's for everybody somebody can write on some midi shit from from your computer and be happy with that but i can't it, it, it needs to be like ah oh, this is so good this sounds so nice so it can be a very simple sound it just needs to be inspiring so i don't know i if that if it sounds good like that i don't need to have the soloist no. i do know when i first got the inspire libraries I was like in heaven. It sounded so good. Now those are very limited libraries. They don't have everything. Oh, yeah. But what they have is so beautiful 
that I just felt, oh, I'm so great. Look, I'm playing. Look at the sounds I'm getting out of this thing. And I was, I just who, felt. Who so, makes those? Who, who develops orchestra those? Tools. Inspired orchestral okay, tools. Okay. There is okay. also and Project it, Sam. They're old now, but the Symphobia one and two. That is yes, such a fast yeah. library. You, you create like, uh, I mean, still epic stuff in minutes. I'm serious. If, and those, I think that's the reason why a lot of uh, cartoon and uh, like short movies and stuff, they still use those libraries because they can create so good stuff in nothing. So. And I think there's stuff in Symphobia that nobody has. They have a lot of effects and things yeah. that, that, you know, if you're looking for it, they're, even today, mm. there is no other place to get it than in those Symphobias. Somebody's asking so. here, uh, Les, uh, isn't Sketch Library something small like Amadeus? And, uh, well, what, what do you say, Simeon, to that? You know, I'm not familiar with um, Amadeus. Um, so I, I, I think, uh, who, who does that? Is that... Um, I forgot. It's, it's a company called Sonic Scores. Yes, Sonic Scores. And it was, okay. created, it was programmed by Tracy Collins of Indigenous. Mm -hmm. and, but okay. I, I, I would disagree... I don't think Amadeus is a sketch library. Me neither. Amadeus has all the instruments in an orchestra, so the only difference between it and BBC, you know, symphony orchestra is that people like the sound of BBC symphony orchestra perhaps more than it. Yeah. But there is nothing that a composer could want to do that they can't do with Amadeus. It just happens to be cheap is all. Amadeus yeah, is very good for its price. I do want to say that, but it, yeah. for me personally, I, I don't want to sound too elite, but the way I work, it wouldn't be enough, the quality of sound. But maybe as a, as a writing library. Uh, but then there's also the question of, do I want to have another library, learn how it works, write all music there, and then transfer it to another library? I, I've doubled the work for me there. So I, that's one of the reasons I don't work with that. I have other libraries that are good to write on but also can be good enough to finish with so i i would say about amadeus well i don't think it's a sketching library i think it could be the very best thing for a young composer to buy because mm. when it's on sale it's a hundred bucks and you have everything you need if you're not personally presently scoring major motion pictures you can learn everything you know you'll have every tool that you could want from choirs to to percussion to it's got everything it's got all the instruments and all the ensembles but i would like if if it's okay i would love to talk about what i think is the ultimate sketching library which there's no second or third or fourth i consider this the omnisphere of sketch libraries and that's kirk hunter's um virtuoso ensembles yeah, and this is Oh, and this ahead. is a library, and this is a library that sold in Black Friday last year for twenty nine dollars. Wow. wow! Can you say the name again? It's Kirk, Kirk Hunter. Hunter's Virtuoso Ensembles. Kirk Hunter. So tell me more about that. What it is is, you have on your screen violins. On the keyboard, it is split violins, violas, cellos basses and it's the same for the brass and it's the same for the woodwinds and if you and you have little sliders so if you want to start one or have overlap you can do that in a second and you have all these different articulations so if you don't really know how to orchestrate you know and you just want to go oh i have this melody what would it sound like in on an oboe what would it sound like on a flute in a second, you can hear um, how it sounds. And they also, it comes with a ton of multis in case, you know, so, you know, different patches put together so that you could be playing um, brass instruments with strings, every combination you can think of. And I find for somebody like me who doesn't know everything, I'm able to go, all right, I have this melody I worked out on the piano or I'm singing to myself. Let me hear what it sounds like on all these instruments. And let me hear what it sounds like when I'm playing a violin and I also have, you know, a tuba. It doesn't matter. I can hear all this stuff instantly in real time. And you can just change those sliders and move it around. And yeah. I think uh, for the way I personally define sketching, it is amazing. And really? while there are others that do similar things, I think it does it does it the best. And I would 
finish by just saying that Simeon recently did a video this week on um, another Kirk Hunter library, and he used the sound of virtuoso ensembles, and so the sound was good enough. I gotta check it for out him now. To yeah, use. You piqued my interest, right? Right, you... Simeon. Would you you'd agree, right? I mean, yeah, the sound. I mean, if, and I actually would. Uh, I actually would take uh, virtuoso ensembles uh, on the road um, in my in my little flash drive uh, <laughs> and. When I would play live, and I would use it to, you know, to have those really fat horns and strings right there. It's 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 very it's very quick and accessible. I would I would I would agree. I would agree with that. Yeah, and it also has very quick. It also it also has percussion. It's got the percussion some really good you percussion. need. It has really good sounding percussion, but not every possible no. percussion instrument but what you need to sketch and it has choirs i mean it's amazing what but comes it, you, in this do you feel like it's, it's only for sketch or you could actually produce with this library would it be good enough as you, to result? you totally could produce yeah. with it you okay. totally could but if i was going to sketch mm. that's where i that's okay. that's where i do go when i'm looking to find out what a melody might sound like mm -hmm. on different instruments so is it both ensembles and solo, or I didn't. Or no, how does, no. How does it work? No, it's just it's just ensembles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The woodwinds are solos. There aren't any uh, ensembles of the woodwinds. Just just solos. But the others I, are ensembles. I haven't heard about this. I'm definitely gonna check it out. I, I'm very happy actually with uh, Opus. Actually, what it does in orchestrator. I wonder if it's similar. Maybe I don't know because they have really nice ensemble mm. patches. Nope. Nope. Somebody's. I don't. Nope. I'm not sure. Okay, I don't either. I gotta check it out. It sounds very interesting to me. Yeah, but, I would. I would say you know it's two ninety nine now, but mm -hmm. you know sign up on the mailing list and because it'll it'll wind up on audio plug in deals or really there's <coughs> there is no reason to pay more than seventy or eighty dollars for it. Yeah. It's is, always is it a, will go down to that. Does it have a um, a small what's it, imprint footprint? Does, does it use little RAM or yeah? Yes. Yes. So you can load everything very quickly and just go. Is that, because that's yeah. Cool. yeah. It's I, totally that. Sounds very nice. I do want to say, though, one thing. I know it's not really maybe the same thing, but I used the piano <laughs> as a sketch tool. That's, Always. That's, yeah, first, that's, that's the first That's the first thing. For everything, yeah. actually. So, so, But I like the idea because sometimes an instrument can be really inspiring. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people could do that. You could just play around with this patch and, wow, this is amazing. But for me, it's piano for everything. If, if you're not conservatory trained mm. and you have trouble, uh, you know, if you're just somebody who would like to make orchestral music, this is a tool where, and that's me, yep. and this is a tool where I can go, oh, how would this be on a clarinet? How would this be on, on an oboe? How would this be if I doubled the violins with the cellos? How would that sound? Well, I find out. And I, mean, I can just keep moving amazing. through this. But and so it's say, not like some other things where, like the orchestra, which I know, I don't have this opus, where they'll just put something together for you. Mm -hmm. This this kind of leaves it open for you to explore. And I, I just think it's a wonderful piece of software, particularly when it's sold for 30 bucks. Yeah. yeah. Now, but seriously, if it only costs 30 bucks, it sounds like a really amazing tool. I'm That's a no-brainer at that at I that just point. wanted to say one thing you can do also, now, if you feel like you have no money or you don't want to wait for the sale, if you have a library or orchestra, this is more work, but it will pay off in the end. Create an orchestra template. So just put all the instruments out in a template in order, whatever you like. And then what you do, basically, if you want to play, you just start that template, play with a whatever instrument. No, I want to try this in the bassoon. So you just move it to the bassoon and you try there. And that's another way to, to sketch out your ideas. So you, you can quickly, without loading all these instruments, you can try something out. So. If, if you're able to just take a few minutes and use something like Unify to set up keyboard splits, you can make your own oh, virtuoso yeah. ensembles yeah. pretty quickly from anything you own. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of... It is so ingenious, all the different multis it comes with. It comes with so many different combinations of, you know, two libraries playing at once where you, you know, it just, it's so inspiring. Wow, that's great. I'm really going to uh, check that out. Thanks for the tip. So, we, we feel like we talked a lot about libraries today, or maybe it's just me. I don't know. It doesn't matter. So, um, let me see. Should we go on with the news and all? 
also the winner of the Ben Oster Prize. <laughs> I can't wait to hear. <laughs> yeah. So, do you have any news first today? Anything that come out this week? Anything worth mentioning? I haven't really checked, to be honest, but I thought you guys had. Well, for me, well, yeah. uh, well, Simeon's got a lot to talk about, but I, I've been working on a video for a month on world music, and it finally came out this, this month, so that was really a big thing for me. So that's my news. Okay. It's fabulous. I, just, I, I encourage everybody to go see that, and uh, Sam, maybe put the link in the description for that video, uh, because Absolutely. I think a lot of people will be inspired by that. Um, and well, you know, last week was a was pretty monumental week for for me because uh, we had uh, you know. Sorry, Sydney, could you just mention the video again so I can put it in because I'm looking. Well, reads uh, reads a world music video. Okay, I will find that. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that's a must watch. I tell you, it was really it's very, really powerful. Um, but uh, yeah, so last week kinetic strings came out. Kirk Hunter. Um, and Steinberg released a new uh, piano library from Sample Tech, co kind of worked on that together for Hallion. It's an upright piano. And then um, Hammers and Waves, they came out with a fabulous uh, keyboard collection. So uh, I was pretty busy last week. Uh, what about getting... Piano Colors? You left out Piano oh, Colors. Oh, yeah. Oh, see, <laughs> see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, Piano Colors is, was fabulous. I mean, all of these, uh, Piano Colors was the, the same company that brought uh, Noir. And this kind of takes Noir uh, down a rabbit hole, uh, for real. It's just, uh, there's so many creative things that you can do with it. It's, it's amazing. Um, and, uh, oh, Sonic Couture. Now, Sonic Couture has got their extended piano, and I think it's still, maybe still on special. So they came out with that one, I think in 2008 or something like that. So they're, they're prepared piano. Um, so I've, I've taken a look at that. There's so many, and it's just like a wave of things. So uh, man, you, you've, gotta, you've gotta check it out. There's no shortage of pianos out there, but each one of them have, like what we were talking about before, their own soul, their own personality. And, and it's just wonderful when you can put them together. Um, so the other, the other thing that's coming uh, tomorrow, Spitfire is announcing something tomorrow, and we're, we're not sure what it is, but I have a feeling it's gonna be something to do with cinematic percussion. And, and, and if I would, to be more, more blunt, I guess it's their, their, and I don't know anything about it other than what's been out there, but I think they're going to try to go head to head with damage uh, and damage too from heaviosity. That's what it sounds like to me from some of the teasers that I've been watching. Um, sounds great. Sorry, I'm, yeah, so I'm just a looking bit. At, I'm trying to catch the chat too. So yeah, me too. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that, yeah. That sounds like really great news. Uh, anything else you want to add, Sermian? Well, David uh, David Anson mentioned something that, that uh, Corey Pelizari is another great YouTuber and reviewer. Uh, mm -hmm. Has a yeah, nice video true. on Amadeus. So uh, I'm going to check that out. When we, yeah. when we get a, off. It is a good one. Yeah, I, I would just like that. to, Thanks. I'd like to quickly add a library, which I think is a gem. Mm -hmm. It's called Mood Guitars. It costs $50. It's from Narath Audio, another one of these little developers, like one guy. And he brought out a percussion library called Rhythmus, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite percussion libraries. And so check it out. It's, it's, unusual it's something you may think you've heard all the guitar libraries you could ever hear but this is different C could you tell shortly what kind of library this is what's the point of it he sampled a few guitars with the idea of doing something moody i would compare it to Taralanti's uh, nada where you oh. would have an instrument but it would also have a pad associated with mm. it so you would have a guitar and a pad and you would have some noise and you can dial all the amount of each and he has guitar instruments and he has harmonics instruments and he's got all these different kind of the classic electric guitars and you put it together and wow. it sounds beautiful because of the paths that he's chosen and the and the degree to which you can decide how you want to fine tune these things it's a beautiful sounding instrument and it has a kind of 
I don't know how to pronounce this, but kind of clev grand type of graphic design where it just looks scribbled and it it's just um, I love that kind of whimsy in design that, yeah. does, that they don't all have to look and sound fine. So everything about this um, I really love and and uh, I think he's one of those people uh, that will become more and more important as he comes out with with these wonderful instruments. And I say the same thing about Rhythmus. Rhythmus is awesome. All right. Wow. Excellent. I have two things I'm going to check out now. It sounds interesting. I, I and I forgot twice. another piano is the, <laughs> the, jangle, the, the jangle box, the jangle box piano from Spitfire. Oh, yes. That, that blew me away. It's okay. the, it's the, um, oh man, the, the, I, I can't, I can't get that. It's the other Abbey Road piano the Beatles used. Um, um, in in that studio, I, I I've just I, it starts with a C H or Challen the Challen, um, and like it is yeah it's, it's like yeah it's a tack piano but it's not a tack piano so the tacks fall down between the hammers to give you that really cool tacky percussive sound but then it's got a mellow part that is just like butter it is it just it just really impressed me and that was a couple of weeks ago. But I just want to make sure, yeah, pianos, pianos are just like, you know, flood, flood of pianos. Yeah, excellent. All right, very good. I thought we should mention the winner. I don't have a snare or something to send anyone. <laughs> um, well, uh, you might have known that we did say that we're going to give out a library from Ben Oster. Was, he was really nice. So Pattern Strings is the library, and we have a winner. Uh, of all you people who left a comment on the last video, and it's Emilio Navas. I don't know if you're watching now, but congratulations. We'll contact you and uh, make sure you get hold of that library. So great. All right. Hope you create lots of nice music with it. So we had one uh, last very exciting news, didn't we, Reed? Do you want to tell us about that? Yes. Um, Maxime Luft. Uh, who is the founder of Organic Samples, and he is now part of the family of orchestral tools people. And um, another young um, in virtual instrument creator like, like Ben Osterhaus, um, he founded Organic Samples about three years ago, and he came out with two uh, solo vocal libraries with the same singer. One was a uh, world singer, and uh, the other one was an opera singer. I went so crazy for, for this library that I did a video on it, and I didn't even do videos in those days, but I, I did it. I, just, I was just so nuts about it. And uh, he did other things, but then he did something called Majestic Horn, which was something he released for two euros. And I don't really know, aside from things that are free, this two euros is the best two euros you could ever spend in virtual instruments. This thing sounds so beautiful. If you're making templates, that's gonna go in it. And it's two euros. And even though um, orchestral tools discovered him and invited him to come over there, even at Orchestral Tools. It's probably the only thing you can buy for two euros at wow. Orchestral Tools. It's yeah. still, he's kept that price. And uh, so he's been working there for a while and he has now um, a new library out, just came out called Tableau in, or Tableau Ensembles. There was a solo string library mm. that he did, Tableau solo strings, and now he's brought this out. So he'll be talking about that, and I know we're gonna wanna ask him you know, questions about his whole career. Right. So hopefully that'll be in our next episode. He said yes, but we haven't actually been able to nail down that date, but hopefully uh, we'll be telling you that he'll be here for our next episode, which is August 4th, I think, when yeah, it it's is. Be two weeks exciting, from today. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I want to give a shout out to our friend Tema uh, that uh, in the chat. Uh, just, oh, yeah. uh, just, just a uh, lovely guy, man. Just love, love that guy. Just such an encouragement. And it's good to see you on the chat. Good to see you with us. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, but that's really, uh, we, we're definitely going to have Maxine on. Uh, we'll find out what day. Hopefully it will be in two weeks. We yeah. will see. 
But that's going to be it for this time. We're in a little bit of a shorter episode. Unfortunately, Matthias was not here. But we talked about reverbs, our model sample, the EQ sketch libraries, and also the winner of the library. It was really nice to see everybody was here. And thanks for all the comments. It was really nice to interact with you guys. So um, if all goes well, we have a guest next week. And otherwise, we'll talk about something else really exciting. Anything else you guys want to add? Or no? If that's the case. It's great to have the band back together today. So it's good, <laughs> good to be back. Yeah, that's true. Good that's to be true. back. Good to be back. <laughs>